no, no, it's time. There's no time right now. No, it is time. Oh, it is time. Yeah, let's get going. We'll just do, we'll pause it, we'll alt tab it. Okay. Oh, at, at your mid part? I'll do it for you while you're announcing it. How's that sound? Cool. Let's pow out for two seconds. Yep. Have them back there with us. We will take them with us. I okay. Think. So or, they're just gonna have this one here. But we're gonna actually let's leave them up here, and you can come up and grab them, and that way you have a really good way to say, "Hey, now it's time for questions." Okay. Because you're grabbing good. the mics. Yes. Yeah, actually, cool. good idea. Okay. So we're gonna put this. Good morning, everybody. Grab a seat. We're gonna get started. We're just a couple minutes late, um, but it's a new space. We're learning things as we go. So, welcome to One Million Cups. We're so glad you're here. What do you guys think of this new space? Is it all right? <laughs> pretty awesome. This is just possible by the wonderful TCC uh, staff and especially Anina. She's going to talk a little bit about TCC in a second, but they've, they've generously donated this space and um, also their support, their time to do technology. And there's a little camera over here that's recording us, so we won't have to do that anymore. They're going to do it for us. And it's just a lot, a lot of support from them um, that we, we just showed up and said, hey, will you help? And they said, yeah. And it was very quick. So uh, if you get a chance and you see those guys, give them a thank you. Um, we are here. We're also supported by Foolish Things. They do the coffee every week. We love meeting over there. And um, we're so glad that they support us for so long and that they continue to support us. Um, also the church at uh, 50, is it 51 or 59? 58, thank you. It's a lot of numbers to remember. <laughs> 58 has been so kind to let us use their space for so long. Um, and we've had other wonderful uh, sponsors. Arcadia Printing's done signs for us. They've done, what else have they done, Randy? Name tags. Name tags. So it's just wonderful to have so much support, and now even more uh, is great. So anyway, I'm Ben Peralt. Um, we've got other organizers here. Alex uh, and Tuna is here training. Uh, Randy's an organizer. Randy, you want to say anything? 
Not really. <laughs> and Matthew as well. So they're, they're learning a little bit about what we do to bring you guys this program every week. Um, and we're trying to do less so that they can do more. <laughs> um, you guys have anything else to say? I'm going to let Anina talk about TCC for a second, if that's no. okay. Give her a hand. Woo! Yeah. Hi, my name is Anina Collier. I'm the Dean of the Center for Creativity and George Kaiser Family Foundation Endowed Chair. And I just wanted to welcome you here to the Center for Creativity at TCC Metro Campus. We're so glad you're here. Um, here at the Center for Creativity, we teach art, design, and communication. And soon we're also adding a new endowed chair in entrepreneurship uh, that will be housed here at the C4C and develop programming for TCC and also through a partnership with 36 Degrees North. So we're really excited as we ramp up our entrepreneurship um, education to have you you guys here. I just wanted to briefly tell you that this space is available for rent for nonprofits and other community groups at very low rates. So if you or someone you know um, has an organization looking for a place like this or also our outdoor, ter outdoor terrace, uh, please let them know. And we offer a variety of free public programming. Uh, this summer we're doing Improv U, which are short lunchtime workshops that are free and open to the public. So if you've ever wanted to try improv, come down here at lunch and just give it a try, 45 minutes. Um, and then in the fall and spring, we offer another series of 45-minute lunchtime workshops called the I Can't workshops. So if you think you can't do something like draw, design, use Fab Lab, sculpt, come here, 45 minutes, it's free. We provide all the supplies. So um, just keep an eye on the Center for Creativity website. Again, we're so glad you're here and have a great meeting. Thank you so much. So I thought of just a couple more things. If you had issues parking or if you weren't sure where to park, we've been told... Um, They've been very kind enough to let us park in any of the TCC labeled spots. The spot behind us here, or if you're familiar with One Million Cups, if you've been parking at the coffee shop parking, uh, is not technically TCC, but it's for a church, and they might not be having events on Wednesday morning, so, you know, it's okay, unofficially okay to park there. And also behind the building is not TCC, but it's probably okay to park there, too. So there's tons of parking. We're going to be here for uh, quite a while, so uh, no, no need to change spaces, but uh, we'll have the doors open, and you're welcome in here. Um, we've got two awesome presenters this morning. Our first is Grant with Grade Deck. He's a friend of mine from high school who I reconnected with recently, and he said, hey, I've got this cool startup. And um, yeah, they really are building something cool. They're changing a really old um, technology into something that might be interesting and new for teachers to use in grading with their students. So without further ado, I'm going to let uh, Grant talk about Grade Deck. Thank you, Ben. Um, as Ben said, my name is Grant Burke. I'm a native of Tulsa. I have a BA in entrepreneurship from the University of Oklahoma. And Grade Deck is an automated test taking platform for teachers and students. However, the best way to get our concept is to walk you through the process that we wish to improve, which is the current test taking process. It's inefficient and it's not conducive to the learning process. We'll, we'll inspect it from two different angles, starting with the student, then moving on to the teacher. Let's look at what it takes a student to take a test. In this instance, they first must go out to buy a test form, incurring a cost before they take a test. Then they go and sit. They fill out their bubble sheet, they turn it in, and they wait, and they wait, and they wait. Normally about one to two weeks in order to get their feedback back. And whenever they do get it back, it's just a test score. It doesn't give them any context about what they've learned on the test or pinpoint them in any direction on their weak areas. Moving on to the teacher, once the test has been turned in, they send them through the grading machine, which is very fast. It does about 300 tests in 10 minutes. However, once that's finished, they then have to take those graded papers to their computer and enter them manually by hand. Now, this can be time consuming and manually tasking with a class of 150 to 200 students. So we've come up with a solution called Grade Deck, an automated test taking platform for teachers and students. I'll walk you through our process. First, the teacher goes online, they can create a class. They can add students to this class, entering their name and their student ID. Then they can create tests for that class. Let's say they're creating their first test. They can enter the question prompt, they can add five assorted answers, they can select the correct answer, but what really differentiates us from our competition is we collect information if the student gets this test question incorrect. For example, the teacher inherently knows if I miss test question number one, then I need to go back to chapter five, section three. They know the section title. They know that it was a multiplication question aside from a division question. So they can tag the question with these certain parameters for the student, as well as leave a general comment about the question. So now they're ready to take a test. They can print off our forms for free online, 
and sit and fill in the bubbles. And then whenever the, the students are finished, they go to the front of the class. The teacher holds our scanner, which is in the form of an iPhone application or Android application. The teacher holds the phone over the test. It grades it instantly, sending the score to the teacher and the student. But not only that, what we do for the student is we show them exactly where the gaps in their knowledge are based on the input from the teacher. And then what we do for the teacher on the back end is we make interesting correlations between their input parameters and the student's outputted score. For example, we can show them like their most missed test section, the um, cohortal resonance of each individual test question, meaning how the questions resonate with the A, the B, the C, the D, and the F students. So we think this brings a ton of value add to the current process. And due to time constraints, I can't show you a demo right now, but during q and I'd love to show you one. A little bit about our market and the competition. We do have big players all the way from Scantron all the way down to little players such as Gradecam. The main thing I'd like you to take from this is their revenue models. Their revenue models are focused on the process of taking a test. Our revenue model is focused on information. So essentially what we do is we give away what they charge for for free. And then on the back end, those analytics, like I'm talking, like those tags, we can run heuristical and statistical analytics over those tags in order to make interesting correlations that the teacher could not make themselves. As well as we have test dispute protection, what that does is whenever the student turns in a test, we save a hard copy to the back end for the teacher for, fu for future reference if there's any disputes between the teacher and the student. A little bit of market analysis. This is top down. Obviously, we're talking, we're um, targeting the education market, specifically high schools. There's about 14.6 million high school students in the United States, and the market is around $177 billion. And that's top down. Let's go from bottom up, starting with our Oklahoma and Texas, which is our initial target market. We believe that this is a great place for us to leverage our beta customers into the full market. Some next steps. Um, from now until four months into the future, we're still during, doing beta testing and iterative development, really refining the platform and making sure we have features that people want. And then we'll launch full product, product launch about four months out. There's some pending beta testers right there. Those are guys from OU that are really pulling our product to the market. And now I'll open it up for questions. If you want to take center mic. All right, so if anyone has any questions, just put your hand up. All right, we have one over here. Yeah, thank you. I think it's a great idea. What I really like is the actual feedback to actually steer the student. That way it's not just a test, it's actually more along to get you learning something. My question is, who pays for the service? Is it the students or is it a government entity, like a public entity that pays to tell right. the Right, so software? there's actually two different ways they can pay for our service. If they want to go top down, meaning enterprise adopted originally, or they can go bottom up from individual teachers. It's actually a per student per semester um, subscription fee, and it's five dollars per student per semester. However, um, this model could change again with our beta testing. We need to ch test price sensitivity and see if where we fall. Got a question here? Uh, walk me through the development of the content from the instructor perspective. How does the test questions get out there? How, how's that put together? Okay. Um, this is a good time for a demo, so I'll just show you guys a demo right now. Okay, so this is, this is great. Dad, this is what the teachers would see. Okay, so once they've signed in, they can obviously see their classes. They can create a new class. They can add the class name, the year, the period. This is, this is aimed at high school, so we give them period numbers. Um, let's click into this math class because it already, already has data. Um, here's the student list. They can add a student, first name, last name, student ID. And then they can create exams. Let's look at this exam since it's already been taken. And then it populates the student data for them. As you can see, you have the A, B, C, D, and F students, and so on. It gives you a question breakdown of the amount of students who got the question correct out of the total population. And then it gives you their student score, just the raw score. 
In the future, you'll be able to click into these and see even deeper analytics and further analysis. But to answer your question on how they get the questions out there, they print them off. But first, they create the question online. So let's add a new question. You can enter the question prompt. You can add up to five answers. We're still implementing those, that tagging system that I was talking about in that general comment, but it'll be there in the future. So once this is set up, we've developed our own test form, which is this right here, and our own scanner in the form of an application. As you can see, it's very fast. So that's graded. That's graded. And we think this is great for small classes of 20 to 30 students. However, we do have a feature in the future that's where you can take all of your test um, forms and put them through a scanner and it'll upload to the PDF to our platform and grade them for you. So if you have a class of 100 to 200 students, this will save you tons of time. So that's how, that's how they get the information. Question over here. Um, I really like the idea, first of all. I just graduated, so the idea of a very frustrating test taking system is fresh on my mind. Um, but I kind of have two questions. First of all, it, you've got a lot of content in a website and an app and all this stuff. Do you have an in-house developer or did you? We, we, actually, I'm one of five people on our team. I'm the business end. All of the other people on our team are actually developers. So there's guys working on the front end on the website. We have iPhone application. We've got an Android application. We've got our, um, um, a library that's basically neutral and it can run on any platform. So our algorithms are pretty, pretty flexible. Yeah, we do have a development team though. And then are you uh, self-funded or do you have angel investors? We are actually like bootstrapped that? right now. We haven't had any funding right now and we're looking for a series seed. Awesome. Go ahead. Oh, there's a question right here. I've done an online instruction in a hybrid context where I might have a class this size or probably smaller. Um, but I, my presence was there, but we were studying um, content in an online fashion. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking the competition is not Scantron and others, but it's, it's the E2020s and the Florida Virtuals. It's a large package, and if a school system can uh, let me handle 60 people instead of 30, um, the, the extra cost for the online learning <coughs> system um, allows me to teach 60 people. And so the whatever the difference is between E2020 per year per student and yours is overshadowed by the fact that, that we've eliminated a person, um, you know, forty sixty thousand dollars $60,000 worth of salary and benefits. So have you looked at that question? Is your competition really Scantron or is it a yeah. possible movement toward a larger um, approach to online learning that encompasses everything you're doing. In fact, really shortcuts some of the stuff you're doing. It automates that process. And have you looked at that question? Um, we honestly have not. And the reason is technology spending in the lower forms of education is not widespread as it is in higher forms of education, right? So there's still going to be the paper form and them taking tests widespread for, we believe, a long time. And the reason the test form is not a part of our model is because we will be shifting completely to the computer at some point. We just don't know when that point is. But as for the competition, we do believe our competition is Scantron because we are a grading platform. We, we aren't necessarily moving into just general instruction. What we're trying to move into is more of a grade book slash context hybrid. Sorry, question over here. So you have a really good program, you have a lot of great content. Piggybacking on that, taking on Scantron, what is your marketing plan? What is your mm -hmm. attack strategy to take on a company that's so in, intertwined with the school systems, whether it be public or private? Yeah, okay, so the thing about Scantron, their model, what they're focused on, what they do essentially is they subsidize their hardware and then they want to do paper volume through that person. So they're focused on just selling paper. And we think this is a bad approach. We don't think that that's conductive to the learning process at all. It's just a piece of paper. So instead, we focus on information. So where we, we, where we really differentiate ourselves is the information we collect. So we get context from both sides, not just the student's scores. So we get, have the context of the test question, those tags, and that general comment. 
Over time, we'll be able to do heuristical analysis with those tags and the test scores that other people cannot do simply because they don't have the information. I have a question back here. Um, I, I was out chasing people down, making sure, so if you said this already, I apologize, but I've heard that Sepulpa is billing themselves as the first district that's going to go completely electronic. Mm -hmm. They're going to, all the way from kindergarten through 12th. Have you talked to them, and are they have, would, or would, they, or would, would that be a, a market for you? Of course, yes. We, again, we do believe that it'll go completely online at one point. Our platform isn't isn't necessarily ready for just online testing, but yes, that's something we'd love to do in the future. Oh, there's a question back here. Um, with the whole content and teachers putting in the content into the computer and like putting A, B, C, D, do you foresee any problems with textbook companies and stuff like that? Um, a lot of teachers use textbook made tests already that they can just print massive copies and give to the students. Right, that's a, that is a good concern. But we do think that if they're entering the by, by, them, by themselves, that it, it, we should be all right. Question over here. So it seems like one barrier you would have to acquiring customers is, the, is convincing them that it's worth it. Because writing a test, the same sort of test without this, this application is easier because you don't have to input all the information for each, each individual question. You get more out of it using your system, um, but you, you may have to convince some customers that it's worth the extra time in, in creating the test to get those analytical um, results. Uh, how do you plan to acquire those customers? And is there a particular subset of the general market that you think would be more likely that you want to target first? Okay. The general, the general subset is just high schools in general. The feedback that we've gotten from teachers is that our process on the front end, although it is a little more burdensome, is not that big of a deal because they're creating the test anyway on Microsoft Word. So we do have actual value adds in that we can create multiple test forms of the same test. So they do that on their, on their own to reduce cheating in the classroom. Well, we do that for them automatically. So we do actually reduce time overall, but yes, there is, there is some barrier of entry in that they do have to do some work up front. Um, we think that by the nature of the platform being free, basically everything you just saw is free, we think that that's, that's a great um, value for us and they'll just take it because it's free and that they don't have to incur a cost in order to take a test. Okay, question in the back here. Uh, compare uh, and contrast what you're doing to what like Khan Academy is doing where it's I mean it's obviously you're not you're allowing for the the teacher to create the content where Khan's creating the content but the analytics and the data and that side of things Khan's doing I think right yeah so Khan Academy does do some statistical analysis of what's going on in the classroom based on raw scores um, they're more of an education platform we're a test-taking platform that has kind of a gradebook attached to it. Got a question over here. I'm concerned with your bottom-up marketing strategy from the price sensitivity standpoint versus Scantron. Because Scantron, if a teacher doesn't want to incur the cost of a Scantron, they can just choose not to use a Scantron. Right. But from the bottom-up pricing model where you're trying to go after individual educators, uh, and you mentioned $5 per student per semester, uh, and so you're asking a teacher of a class of 30 to pay $150 out of her pocket uh, just to give a simple test. Can you talk about maybe a potential different, uh, a different pricing strategy from the bottom-up marketing perspective that maybe, might be more advantageous for that situation? Maybe I wasn't clear. Um, this is free. So everything you saw and everything I've talked about is free. What we charge for our analytics on the back end was statistical and heuristical analytics over those um, tags and the, the scores that the students get. So we're not charging for the, the test process. That's where we really beat our competition, is we give away what they're doing for free and then charge on the back end for information. So uh, they, can use our test for, they can use our platform in their class for free. Question in the back. So I think the analytics and the tagging and all that are the, are the real cool thing about this. But the limitation is the multiple choice only format of the test. And so the question is, have you thought about how you might 
provide support for the types of questions that have to be graded by a human teacher, but also kind of, you know, roll that data and those analytics back in with the rest of the stuff? It's a great question, and yes, of course. Um, we're working on features right now that can take things such as, like, um, free response or, like, physics questions and put it on the platform for the teacher so that it's there to grade. What we found after talking with teachers is that whenever they grade something like free response, they go individually by the question. And what I mean by that is they'll start on question one on person one and they'll go to question one on person two so that the grading is consistent overall. So what we're, we're working to do is to automate that process and put it online for them so that it's easier on them. But yes, we are working on ways to do that. But not necessarily OCR or uh, optical character recognition. We're not doing anything like that. Just simply taking the text from the page and putting it on the platform for them to grade later on. I've got a follow-up question to the question about pricing. You talked when we met about Scantron's model of getting a school or a system to buy the machine. How is that different than giving it to teachers for free? Right. Um, so Scantron's model, you're incurring a cost no matter, you're incurring a cost to take a test. Our model is we give you the software, the paper for free, and you take the test for free. How are you incurring that cost? How, what do you mean? How are you incurring that cost? What do, what do you mean? What, what, what costs? What aspect of Scantron costs? Oh, the paper form. Okay, so the paper form costs 10 cents to a dollar depending on the volume you buy at. Okay. Question over here. Yeah, as a follow up to the question regarding uh, teachers, I'll call it grading open end tests or grading, let's say, essays, you mentioned that uh, teachers that you have um, worked with will grade questions individually by the question rather than by students. What about? Uh, teachers that will grade an individual student versus an individual question. Uh, have you given thought to how that that may have an impact on, I'll call it consistency, of how you view a grade? Uh, I mean, um, as far as consistency, I mean, I guess that's, that's up to the individual teacher if they can remain consistent over time while grading individual people. However, they'll be able to modify the platform to whichever way they want to where they can they can go just the individual view of an individual student or they can do piece by piece such as question one over all students then question two over all students so it'll be flexible okay so that wraps up our q a and the one final question uh, what can one million cups and the tulsa entrepreneurial community do for you like us on Facebook. We're looking for Series Seed right now, so if you have any investor connections, that'd be awesome. Um, and just spread the word about the platform to any teachers you know. All right, thank you. Okay, awesome. A couple of new things that we forgot to mention. Quick housekeeping item that's somewhat important is that there are restrooms right around the corner here so if you have to go I mean you can make the awkward walk in the middle of the presentation or you could wait till the beginning or the end he's pulling up the announcements so I'm gonna go over those as well as always we do have a newsletter if you guys aren't on our newsletter yet you can shoot us an email at Tulsa at one million cups .com. we have a hidden joke in every newsletter Ben says I've never found it it's not there, it's not there. that's the joke okay so <laughs> the joke yeah. is that you keep looking yeah, that's right <laughs> We're also looking for more present presenters. If you have a startup idea or something that you have vetted out, um, even if it's at the early stage of a beta, we're interested in hearing from you. If you know of somebody, um, kick them over our way. If they present, we'll buy you a cup of coffee free um, in the back, of course. We're easy to find because we're all wearing these same shirts. Yeah. So again, we have Randy in the back and Tuna. We have Matthew, Ben, and find somebody in brown, and we will get them taken care of. We're also looking for Passport presenters. If you have presented in the past, we have a lot of communities nearby in um, Dallas and Arkansas that would love to have you. We've had a couple Passport presenters come here. It's always an awesome experience to see what other people are doing, uh, and it's a way to get your startup back out there and get really great feedback from other groups, which is awesome. 
And if you need more space, we have uh, Jessica here with The Forge to answer any particular questions. But The Forge has two open offices, one open office. They go fast. So if you have uh, need of a grid space, we're in The Forge now, as is Skater Trainer. It's an awesome facility. You should definitely check us out. Go connect with Jessica, or you can shoot her an email, jessicaflint at tulsachamber.com. Lastly, if you have an announcement, shoot that to Tulsa at onemillioncups.com as well, and we will make sure and include that in there. Generally, what we'll do is we'll announce the new announcements a week to week, and then we'll uh, eventually have a scrolling bar in the very beginning. You can just check out what else we have going on. So I think that's the last one. Without further ado, I'm excited about this next one. Uh, we have a startup called Jennifer Juice, and um, by its namesake, they actually make fantastic cold-pressed juices here locally, locally sourced. It's one of the only kind, uh, or only one of its kind, and we have Sam Johnson here to tell us more about it. Give him a hand. This one, this one works over here. Hi, I'm not Jennifer. I'm Sam Johnson. And uh, I have Pooja Stork with me back there. She's one of our uh, fantastic inventors, recipe inventors, employees. You'll meet her at the end of this thing. Um, and get the latest edition of Tulsa People, which just came out, I think, this week. We're an editor's pick in there, so we're pretty excited about that. Um, so what I wanted to do, just quickly, I was invited to come back. We presented at One Million Cups about a year and a couple months ago when we were brand new, just getting started. See here. Forward. Okay. Um, and at that time, you know, there were a lot of unknowns, and we were sort of, we thought we had a great idea, but we didn't yet understand the market or anything like that. So I'm back here just a little bit over a year later to kind of give you guys an update on how it's gone, what's worked well, what hasn't worked so well, what we've learned, where we're going from here, and all that other kind of stuff. So I'm going to try to do it pretty quickly. Um, for those of you who don't know, Jennifer Juice, we are um, cold pressed, raw, unpasteurized juice, fresh juice. It takes a lot of effort and equipment to do this. Um, so it's not an easy thing to do, but when we moved here from New York City, we noticed that there wasn't anybody doing it here. And, and in a place like New York or Austin or Chicago or San Francisco, it's a really big deal. So my wife, Jennifer, was into juicing. Um, we, thought, we thought maybe Tulsa was ready for something like this. So that's, uh, that's kind of how we got going. So a couple things, right, so a couple things that um, I think over the past year we've been pleased to discover. There's, uh, there's kind of two sides to the business here. The whole business of pressing raw produce into juice, pure juice, and then selling it as pure juice or, or bottling it and selling it at a, at a bar is a tricky business because the, the product is expensive, anything you waste kind of goes, cuts straight into your bottom line. So. There's a, there's a second side of the business, which is about selling pre-ordered juice in the form of a detox package. People who are really into juicing will get into, um, you know, kind of going on a juice-only diet for some period of time, either for a day or for three days or sometimes for even longer than that. And this is something that we weren't sure that this market was ready for, um, but we started it and we were pleasantly surprised. We've had kind of just sort of word-of-mouth adoption of the, of the product and we were constantly, you know, consistently getting orders for this stuff. So we've refined the product. We've got three different levels that we call of the detox package, ranging from a very simple kind of one day, take a break from you know, alcohol and caffeine and all that, and have a salad and some juice and a nut milk instead, to our level three, which is three days of nothing but juice. And the level three there, 96 ounces of, sorry, uh, my slides have, have not been updated. Sorry, that's 96 ounces a day of juice. That ends up being uh, quite a bit of volume of juice that we're selling. So if we can pre-sell that, then the risk to the business is quite a bit less because we don't, we don't waste anything. We know that it's going to be bought as, as we're making it. Um, so the adoption for the detox thing was, was a great thing for us, a pleasant surprise, and that kind of continues to grow. Another thing that I was pleasantly surprised about and never would have predicted was how well kind of selectively using a platform like Facebook to market a business in Tulsa works. And secondly, how much Tulsa loves a deal. So we try to keep things fresh by doing things like a featured ingredient every month to sort of stay front of mind. This month it's lime, so you'll find some special blends around lime if you come into the store. Um, but also things like $2 two days, Tuesdays and $5 Fridays, these kind of promotions that we do weekly get people in the store. And, uh, and it's a great thing for us because specifically $5 Fridays, 
we start fresh with empty fridges every single week just because of the nature of the product. So that gives us an opportunity to give everybody a deal and also kind of clean out the inventory at the end of the week. Um, so both of those things I think we've been really excited about. There's a couple of challenges that we've wrestled with um, and are still wrestling with and sort of just now kind of, I feel like, getting an edge on a little bit. And the first is just the pro problem of inventory management for a business like this. So we take raw produce, we put it in the fridge, we wash it, we prep it, and then when we're ready, we grind it up, we press it in a hydraulic press, and we make juice out of it, and we try to sell that juice before it goes stale, which is in some cases only you know, two or three days. So food costs are high. Material costs, bottles, labels, things like that are high for us, and labor costs are high because it's a labor-intensive product. So we have to be very careful about making sure that we're ordering the right amount, we're pressing the right amount, and we're wasting as little as possible. There's not a lot of technology infrastructure out there. I'm an old technology guy, and I'm shocked to find that there's just not a lot of really good tools out there for managing this kind of inventory problem. So we've built a suite of Google spreadsheets, and we have a workflow now where the girls in the bar, as they're pressing, are recording you know, the invoices from the orders as they come in, the dates and quantities that are pressed, the yields, the amount that's tossed, and all that other kind of stuff. So we can go back and we can look at costs, and we can look at costs weekly or monthly or whatever and adjust our prices and our wholesale prices. Um, that's the first thing that's really been more of a challenge than I think we expected. The second thing is the location of the store. So we intentionally, um, we intentionally opened a store instead of a food truck, and we intentionally did it downtown, and I think that those were both absolutely the correct decision but we're in a beautiful building and we're not on the street. So we don't get people stumbling in and discovering us kind of naturally. And we didn't think that that would happen too much for a product like this in Tulsa. But we're finding that as our customers grow and our sales grow, the percentage of repeat customers is always higher than 50%, which means as new people are discovering us, they're coming back. So we need to get in front of more people. So if I could do it all over again, I'd be on the street where people would see us. Um, the third angle that I think is good in an area for growth of us, for us is the wholesale business. We're the only game in town. There's, there's nobody else at this point in Tulsa who's making juice the way that we're making juice that has this kind of equipment. I think this is the only machine in the state right now like this. It's a big, big ugly, clunky thing, but it, all it does is it squeezes the daylights out of this produce and makes just pure juice. So we deliver pure ginger juice to tall grass. We deliver probably six or seven different juices to raw intentions. That's a growth opportunity for us. And then marketing through channels like fitness-related businesses is one way that we get out there into the community and make sure more people know about us. So we're doing right now a promotional every Wednesday for the noon class lunch delivery for pre-ordered lunches at Sculpt Tulsa and Blue Dome and, and also over on Peoria. But food is a sideline for us. Food is sort of secondary to the juice. It's all about the juice. So what's next? We're going to expand our menu. We have a talented team of inventors, including Pooja back there. We need to get out, get discovered more. Um, and we're looking at a second store location right now, but we probably don't have plans to do that until later in the year, early in the spring next year. Um, so I'll take some questions now, and then I'll talk to you about some samples that we have in the back. All right, yeah. So first question in the front. This is unique because just last week we had a presentation from Nourish Cafe. So could you tell us, since the, it seems like there are overlaps of, of what you do and what they do, compare and contrast the two of, of your business, that their business and yours, and what are the advantages that you offer that they don't? So there's a philosophical, religious difference between the two products, right? The thing that we have in common is the customer base, the people who are into juicing, they want to do something healthy, they're looking for ways to kind of do something healthy with their diet in addition to their lifestyle and stuff like that. Um, Nourish makes blended drinks, which means they'll take a bunch of uh, produce, fruit, vegetables, whatever, throw it in a blender, blend it up, there's pulp in there, um, it's chewy, a lot of people like it for that reason, because there's, there's some, some substance to digest there. Ours is just pure, pure juice. So, uh, you know, advantages to, to both, but fundamentally different things. And um, I think that, you know, when I listen to Nourish's presentation, they've done phenomenally well at growing their customer base. Um, they seem to be kind of, they seem to be kind of focused on, on building out their food menu a little bit. And I think that that's something that we sort of see as, as really a sideline. I think where our growth comes is from more capacity to produce the pure juices. So we'll add more ingredients, we'll do bigger volumes, but it's uh, fundamentally for us, it's going to be about being a, a pure juice factory. Uh, I have a question. 
Have you considered partnerships with uh, any local like healthcare organizations or uh, physician offices that focus on uh, this type of natural health? So we have, and we've, we've tried to do a couple things. And I think one of the challenges that we've had over the past year is sort of getting up to capacity to be able to sort of uh, to, to, to supply a demand for somebody who might kind of need something we'd have trouble producing. But there's a, there's a health care group called WellQuest in South Tulsa. Um, and they're kind of a holistic type group, right? So they do, they have doctors and physicians, but they also do kind of nutrition counseling and all that other kind of stuff. And we did a little pilot where we sold some of our juices in their store. So we would deliver juice to them twice a week. And it was a, it was a difficult thing for us to do just because it's a 30 minute drive there and back and all that. And so I think doing kind of co-marketing things with them has been really good for us. Trying to use them as a reseller kind of hasn't worked for, for probably a few different reasons, but those types of companies are, are great sort of channels for us to get out. Yeah. Oh, question in the back. Hi there. <clears throat> Thank you for the presentation. Could you give us an idea of the size of this opportunity um, without you divulging any secrets, but you know, what kind of revenues or perhaps uh, customer base are you talking about today versus five years from now? So that's the, the answer that I would give you if I was trying to raise money would, would be about a billion dollar industry and I would point out players that have gotten just massively big doing this kind of stuff that are largely East Coast based. But the way that they're doing it is they're shipping product, and the way that they're able to ship product is if they're not pasteurizing it, they're doing some alternative that kind of kills the bacteria and makes the shelf life extend. When we're not doing that, it makes it a very localized product for us. So the way that I see our business expanding is by, it's almost like I kind of, the analogy I, I think of as like a yoga studio, right? So if we opened a store in Plano, then that store would look very much the same, would have the same equipment, but would be getting different produce because it would be getting local produce, so there would be slight changes, and it might have different recipes, right? So we're not going to scale sort of in a, in a commissary kind of model. We're going to scale uh, stores, but they're all sort of very hyper-local stores. So just because the reach is fairly limited, you can't... Um, you can't sort of grow massive, massive revenues around the store. I mean, that sounds like sort of, that would kill any chance for me to raise venture capital. But you can make a pretty good business around a store. It's a, it's a small local business. So the challenge for us is to figure out how to make that replicable. And our first store, we made intentionally a lot of mistakes and tried equipment that we ended up kind of not landing on as the right thing and all that. And I think the second store we could do very efficiently. It could be much smaller. We would know the right equipment. Operating costs and, and capital costs would be a lot lower. Um, and it would be a profitable business much quicker. We have a question in the front. You have really cool imagery with your brand. Like I can see one of these cir circular fruits being a bumper sticker or something. Um, and and have so so. Um, my question is, how are you developing customer loyalty and and making your customers feel like they're a part of this really cool uh, kind of movement? that you have started? So, thanks, and if you want a bumper sticker, I've got one for you. Uh, I've got about a thousand of them, so you can have one. Uh, I, so, I'm just, I'm a big uh, lover of brand and believer in brand, and I think of most successful businesses, like, you know, I always think about Apple, right? They're, they're a lifestyle company as much as they are a product company, and um, I, think, I think, you know, maybe it's a little bit subliminal, but I think people, people attract to sort of a fresh, clean brand and image and all that. And that's just kind of part of what we want the, what we want the whole thing to be, right? It's fundamentally about the product. And, you know, if you need ginger juice, come to us because you're going to get the best or maybe the only ginger juice in town. But, but remember us because, you know, you liked how clean the store was. You liked how friendly the staff was. You liked the logo, maybe enough to put it on your car, right? All that kind of stuff. And there's just sort of... Um, you know, there's sort of a sort of a sense of lifestyle around it that's that's clean and fresh and sharp and you know everything that we sort of kind of want it to be. Do you have any specific programs to kind of reward your, your uh, high frequent customers? So we do a lot of of kind of looking at who our return customers are, and we'll occasionally there's there's no sort of formal machine for this, but we'll occasionally reach back out to people who have 
done our cleanse programs a couple times. We'll offer them a discount to do another one. We'll do, we'll do things like that. We do um, make an effort to kind of reward loyal customers like, like everybody should. We use, um, just to open the kimono even further, we use Square for our POS. And Square is doing quite a bit in the way of providing tools for analytics to, to basically kind of track customer loyalty and, you know, um, product sales and stickiness and all that other kind of stuff. So that's very helpful. That's just another way that we can look at it. Oh, this question. Oh, you answered your question. Yeah. Uh, I did. Yeah, you answered his question. I, did, I have another question where uh, you talked about some of the early stage hurdles that you had. Um, can you talk about uh, a few of the issues you, get, you guys had earlier on and how you overcame them? So we, I didn't know anything about running a food and beverage business. I mean, that, that was the problem. I was, a, I was a startup guy, but I was a software guy. And so I assumed that very naively that there are some fundamental things, you know, that you need to get right when you're building a business and that yeah, I could figure it out as I went along. And there's a big difference between raw fruits and vegetables and software in that, you know, one of them rots and, and one of them lasts forever. So um, I, I, think, I think I was a little bit naive about that and I think we really scrambled to kind of get on top of some of those things. But um, we, we made a mistake kind of not finding a storefront that was right on the street. We did it intentionally. It was... We, we misjudged kind of how ready Tulsa was for this product. And I think that's been a, a, a real challenge for us because we need, to, we need to really focus now on just kind of getting visibility however we can get visibility because we have really good response. When we get in front of new people, they like the product. A question on the front. So to maybe expound on that a bit. What have you done with your, uh, your area, because you're part of the DECO district, which yeah. is just right up the street. Have you done anything with the DECO district association to be able to uh, bring in more business through that? I know a lot of the, the local companies around there are part of that, and I know that that does help drive business. They do you know, specials, special days, stuff like that. Have you done anything, uh, anything like that? We've done a little bit. So we've, we're a member of the DECA District Association. We've, um, you know, we've tried to participate, and they have like a, a $2 Tuesday promotion, so we try to line up with things like that that they do. They do events, um, unfortunately, often on weekends, and worse than being in the back of an historic building downtown is being in the back of an historic building downtown that's not open on weekends, but that's kind of where we find ourselves. So we haven't been able to participate in a lot of those kind of things. But... Um, we, we love that area, and we think that, that that area and everything that's going on in the DECO district, but the, also the fact that it's so proximate to these other little districts that are building up kind of puts us in a, in a great sort of central location for just the kind of people that we want to be interacting with. We need to find a way to take our product out onto the street, into parks, to events, to the 5Ks and the color runs and things like that. Um, and we have some ideas, so you might see us out this summer, but... Um, but not yet. But I think that'll be one of the next things we do. I have a question here. Sorry. Hey, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Great product, by the way. And also, I agree with everything that's been said about the visual aspect of it. Beautiful logo and brand that you're building. Um, my name is Ian. I'm with Lamar Outdoor Advertising. We do most of the billboards, posters, digital, pretty much everything uh, outside. Um, have you considered, I know you've talked a lot about increasing visibility. Um, and that's one thing that I've kind of specialized in, especially with small businesses that do need increased visibility. And something that's there 24-7, not just something that's there for a day or one run or one event. Yeah. Um, have you ever considered that? And do you know what your cost of acquiring a customer is currently so that you could really measure that and see if it would be efficient and would be effective? So I, I think we haven't considered it seriously. We've thought a little bit about radio and, and billboards and those kind of things. And I think where I always get to and then stop thinking about it is the fact that we are so hyper-locally focused, right? Mm -hmm. I don't want to be on the KMOD morning show because I'm not, because they're, they're more about a demographic that's very broad, right? And what yeah. I want is the people that are driving into downtown for work, right? I want those people to hear about me in the morning, regardless of what kind of music they listen to, sure. so that they'll remember me at lunchtime, right? And that's really tough to do. And we thought about, you know, Radio IDL was all kind of supposed to be about hyper-local and, and all that. But, you know, same kind, of, same kind of challenge. I mean, they're an internet radio company, too. So I, I, get, I get stuck on that a little bit. I, you know, outdoor advertising, 
could could work really well for us. I think if, if, if we were able to do it on the right kind of small scale and mm-hmm. be very kind of specific about exactly where and how we did it, I always think probably maybe naively, maybe totally incorrectly about somebody like Lamar as being sort of too big and too broad kind of for what we're trying to do with one store downtown. But if I'm wrong, then, you know, we should talk about that. Yeah, we have like people that specialize in local businesses like myself. So like I've done specifically campaigns targeted to specific businesses, even B2B businesses downtown uh, that have been very effective and that were very local, that didn't reach out of the loop, right? So that we're in the loop and we're specifically targeting businesses that they're right next to, right? So you're talking about, you know, targeting something within a block. So I'd love to help you with that. And also just great brand and keep doing what you're doing. Thanks. Thanks. The question over here. Hello, my name's CJ. I was going to ask you, have you ever thought about partnering this summer with some of the snow cone shops and having them uh, kind of just host some of your things? Because I know I buy snow cones for my nephew, but having a healthy juice, and they have refrigerators too. So that's, that's interesting. So my, my gut says that we're pretty poorly aligned as a product with snow cones, right? Like we contrast ourselves, I think, when we describe our product with Jamba Juice and with sort of, you know, the less healthy, faster things. And that's kind of how I think of the snow cones thing. On the other hand, there is something attractive about the fact that these snow cones guys are on all these different corners and they sort of have the infrastructure and everything like that. So, I, you know, so the parents can get something real and the kids can get a snow cone, maybe. Maybe there's a snow cone you can make with, you know, with raw juice. All right, question up front. Yeah. All right, from a, uh, so you're a software guy, so you understand from a software perspective, you could write an application and it can sit there and it can sell itself. Um, In the food industry, being a startup, have you hit your make or break point yet? Uh, Will you know when you've gotten there? And being the restaurant with razor thin margins, is it worth the struggle? And, and how far do you carry on the struggle to get to that make or break point? And then it depends on what you're trying to, what, what you want to get from it. I mean, this is a, this was a, a, a business that my wife and I started together because it was, it was something that she was pretty passionate about. Um, it turns out she ended up being more passionate about the two twins that she had a week after we started this. So she's not spending as much time on it as she had intended to. But she does still think a lot about it. And so we, we always knew it was going to be a lifestyle business. I like the challenge of trying to make something like this work. Um, how we reach make or break. Like, uh, I don't think... So it's going gonna, it's gonna to work. It, it, it works. Um, you know, it's never going to be sort of a, a knock it out of the park kind of thing. However, I think, I think, I feel confident that we can take everything we've learned with this first store and we can create a, a, a template for a store that's replicable um, on a scale large enough that it becomes pretty interesting to whoever might be interested in something like that and, and have kind of the pockets and the reach and everything to really scale it out. The, when you say the system, you just mean... The whole thing. I, right, I don't know if it'll be franchising. I, I don't know that franchises is maybe the right way to go. I think it might just be wholly owned stores. I think we might have three or four, you know, Jennifer's Juice shops, um, along with a couple, you know, bicycles with a cooler on the front of them around town. And then if we decide that it's time to move to Texas and Missouri we might look for a partner to help us do that. Because I, that would be, you know, even, even if each one added a little bit to the top of the line, that would be a full-time, full-time thing for me to do. So it'd, be, it'd just be hard work, yeah. All right, question in the back. I just have a random comment. We just got really excited about the ideas of the snow cones with the juice. I've never heard of that before, but um, I, t- two sold back here for Good. sure. All right. they, great, great. Yeah. Any question in the front? So three so far. I'm in food service too, and I know it's really hard, but when I look at your setup, you have a really clean product and a clean setup, and I'm kind of your ideal customer, but I really think the best thing is the levels, and I looked on your website, just on your phone, but making it obvious what the benefits of it, because it says detox, and it's like you kind of get it, but yep. really pushing the value of what this detox could do, and then added value, because you're not in an ideal area, yep. and you have admitted that multiple times, a delivery service, 
or partnering with businesses, get your business to be more healthy, things because your your money is in big item sales, not yeah. the one and done person. So what are you doing in way of getting the big cater sale, the big delivery forced effort, I have to keep buying this, I'm subscribed, I'm on board type long-term customer as opposed to the one and dones? So, so we have a couple of those. We are sort of um, you know creeping towards more and more. We're adding them slowly. We have a little bit of a sort of a catch-22 in that I can't sign. There, I, I've only got. I'm, I have a limited amount of capacity to make juice. I can make a lot more than I'm making right now, but I can't make ten times as much as I'm making right now. That that requires more equipment, more staff, that kind of stuff. So I need to sort of grow into a much bigger thing. Um, the customers that we have, like, we call them our wholesale customers, but the ones that we're delivering sort of just raw, pure product to, and they're using it to make cocktails or to do their raw cooking or whatever, they're repeat customers. Um, and we have, you know, we d for some of them we deliver, for others they come and pick up. But those are kind of long-term sort of contracts that we get with those people. And I think that's, that's an area where we need to grow. We need to kind of do it methodically, but you're, but you're right. That's where we make money, that. And then, you know, expanding the program with, with the detox. And we could do a lot better job of educating people on kind of what benefits you're getting from this. Because people who do it, people who do it tend to like it. People who do it for the first time because a friend told them to tend to be quite surprised by, you know, what it is and what it ends up being and all that. Yeah. All right. Question in the front here. Thank you. Hi. I just wanted to follow up on the whole snow cone. I have... Uh... Seriously, I have, I have four children, yeah. and um, you know, there are certain restaurants that we don't go to because they don't offer healthy alternatives for the parents. So I would really encourage you to consider um, options for satisfying both the children and the parents' needs, especially if it's hot. I haven't had your product. I don't know what it tastes like, but I also have a hard time getting my kids to eat their vegetables. Yeah. So if your product tastes good and could be marketed to um, an alternative for sneaking in some red bell peppers and spinach and other things that you had, you know, you would have... Um, a different market set maybe for the parents that have kids that it's, they want them to have a healthy diet. So right. that, That's great. It's great to hear all that. And so I'm, now I'm super curious about these snow cone shops. And I'm going to try to figure out like <laughs> if they're individually owned or if they're all kind of, if I can go talk to one guy or what I do. Yeah. <laughs> Unfortunately, we are out of time, but we do have one more question. What can we do as a community to help you? So I'm looking for a few things. Um, I... I don't care too much about Facebook likes or anything like that, but I am looking for the, the problems that we're dealing with. We're looking for real estate. Um, we're looking for kind of small street frontage, high traffic area. I constantly look for that. You know, if anybody is close to that kind of thing and, and has any ideas for me, that's terrific. I'm looking for a super smart tech whippersnapper intern or employee that's going to help me really develop these spreadsheets into kind of an inventory management platform for this business because I don't have time to do it myself and I'm not as smart about that as I used to be. Um, you know, and then we're looking for potential customers, wholesale customers. They, all these artisanal cocktail bars around here, they should be using fresh raw ginger and they should be using red bell pepper juice. Nobody's making a cocktail with that stuff. So um, introductions to those kind of people is very helpful. Since we're out of time, we have samples in the back, so I just want to quickly tell you guys what it is. I think we'll, we've definitely got enough for everybody to have one. I don't know if everybody can try everything. So there's um, three different samples that we brought. One is uh, our green juice. It's kind of it's called our G1. It's the original green juice. If you've ever had a green juice, it won't be a surprise. If you haven't, it might be a surprise because it's not a very sweet juice. It's got spinach, parsley, ginger, cucumber, and lemon. So it's delicious, but it's a little bit tart. But this is what people who love green juice tend to really love. Um, we have a red juice, which is a new invention. It's going to go on the menu pretty quick that we're calling Red Delicious right now. It's ginger, apple, kale, beet, red bell pepper, carrot, and lime. Super great. And then the last one is, is a coffee. We started doing cold coffees. So we make a nut milk out of cashews, and we started mixing that nut milk with um, cold brew coffee concentrate from Double Shot a little while ago. And we have two versions on that theme. We have just the latte, which is the pure um, cashew milk, and then we have a mocha where we make the cashew milk, we put cacao nibs in there with it. So it's got a little bit of a chocolate thing to it. So the cashew milk is cashews, agave, cinnamon, vanilla, coconut oil, 
and and then cacao in the in the uh, in the mocha one plus this cold brew concentrate from Double Shot. So they're in little bottles back there. There's about 20 of each bottle. There's also a stack of my business cards and each business card has a green dot on it. And if you bring a business card with a green dot in, we'll give you a $9 bottle of juice for six bucks. So it's like, it's like a coupon that I made at the last minute last night. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Sam. I look forward to trying some of those. Um, so what do you think? New location, new feel. We can be as loud as we want. Well, we are interested in your feedback, so find one of us. Um, let us know suggestions, improvements, things that we can um, do to, uh, to make it better. But uh, in the meantime, I think uh, Ben had some giveaways. There you are yeah. right there. Everybody stand up if this is your first time at One Million Cups or your second or more time? Really quick. If you've been here once or more than once, stand up. Awesome. Okay. Once or more. Okay. Is this on? Oh, yeah, it is. Okay. So if this is your first time, sit back down. Who are you? And did somebody bring you? This was kind of hard. I guess I did the opposite of what I should have done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you're all standing. We get to relax a little bit. Did somebody bring you? You don't count. Did somebody bring you? Or did you guys just come? Did anybody in this group bring you to One Million Cups today? The people Who brought you? Who, who is it? All right, we got a mug for him. Anybody else? Woo-hoo! Okay. Now, sit back down if you have been to less than five One Million Cups. Am I asking it really confusing? Yes. That's- Stay standing if you have been to more than five One Million Cups. Is that better? Stay standing if you've been to more than 10, 20, 30. If you've been an organizer, sit down. (laughs) If you already have a mug. All right, there we go. (laughs) We got a t-shirt for you. We'll get you a t-shirt. Awesome. That's all I got. Anything else? All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, Get juice in the back, and let us know if you have any suggestions. See you here, same place, same time next week.